Balancing a well-stocked pantry can mean the difference between managing an effective food vault or just storing frozen money. That's what we're going to talk about today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code, every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. We are live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. If this surprises you, then you should go to webcookingclasses.com slash, oh, other way, slash live <laughs> and uh, register for my alert system. So I always send out a message 15 minutes before I go live. Uh, welcome everyone. Jeez, we have a lot of people with us today. This is really cool. Hi, Sheldon. Hi, Jane. Uh, hi, Michael. Candy is with us and Dan and Alan, a guy and Bob, all our great friends are with us. Who said first time on here? I saw hi from Wales. Uh, hi, uh, Debbie Carroll is always with us uh, from Wales. Christine, that's who I wanted to point out. Christine is with us for the very first time. Welcome, Christine. This is the Carefree Cooks Code, and our manifesto of sorts is we're the Carefree Cooks. Christine, this is what you're getting involved with today, right? We, cre uh, we bring our friends and family together when we create our own recipes. We we learn every time we cook. Uh, we define our own cooking styles because we practice the pro methods that make us love our cooking. And again, uh, we're uh, here every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. I've got a what am I for you today. Let me check this out here. The what am I today has eight letters in front of you, and it looks like it's uh, an onion, uh, looks like a little celery, maybe there's some carrot there. Oh, and there's a French flag in the corner. There's some hints for you. That's the what am I. Tell me in the comments section below. There you go, below. Tell me in the comments section below what is the what am I today of eight letters, those things, and for some reason there's a French flag there. So yeah, we're together again. <laughs> I love it. Every Tuesday, I, I know a lot of you really look forward to these uh, sessions. I look forward to them as well. I'm even traveling today. I'm at my mom's house, um, but I cannot just skip a session because something always comes to me during the week. Something always comes to my mind between Tuesday and Monday that I realize I have to share with you because each of us is working on our own individual carefree cooking journey. And, you know, maybe somebody is here like Christine for the first time because they're not sure, uh, I don't know, how to make an Alfredo sauce, right? Or, or a sauce like their mom did. That's what motivates them. They want to be carefree when they make their own Alfredo sauce. And then their grandkids are going to have to ask someone in the future how you made it, right? This is how things continue. Carefree co cooking it's something that you can pass on to the next generation. I mean, it is such a, a massive skill that certainly lasts your lifetime. And if you remember cooking with your grandma or you're cooking with your grandkids now, it lasts multiple lifetimes. Trust me. Uh, I know there are dozens of people here because they're they're tired of eating the same thing again and again. And they're on a journey to be carefree in just whipping up new meals and, and getting new ideas in the kitchen. And, you know, I know the names of so many people, many that I read a minute ago, that took the first step toward becoming a, a carefree cook after they decided to take control of their health and their wellness goals through better food and cooking. But, you know, the really cool thing about working toward breaking this carefree cook's code is that we're all on the same journey. Maybe for different reasons, but we all march forward together toward improving our lifestyles through better food and cooking. And then when you do, when you reach your goals, no matter what they are, you're carefree. 
there you are. Because one of the greatest benefits of being a carefree cook is that you can cook for any diet or any desire using the same repeatable and dependable methods of cooking that chefs are taught in cook culinary school. And that means that you can just reach into your pantry grab a bunch of ingredients and be confident in how you're going to cook them and you wind up with something great, right? But to do that, you need a pantry. You, you know, you need a, a certain storage of a certain amount of ingredients and a pantry is basically the ingredients that you like to keep on hand. But there's a skill in balancing a well-stocked pantry, having the items you need on hand to whip up great meals quickly in your carefree style versus storing excess money in your kitchen. And it's what I call frozen money. And I'm gonna explain this in a minute. But today's topic is one that I'm asked about all the time. It's, it's incredible how many times I get a Facebook and email messages. I get something that says, uh, I get email messages that says, Dear Chef Todd, what pantry items should I keep on hand at all times? Typical question that I get a lot. I get, hey, Chef Todd, what are the best ingredients to have in your kitchen. And then I got this one, Chef Todd, what's in your panties? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, I'm hoping that this is an autocorrect problem, okay? They meant to write pantry and they wrote panties. It, it, it upset me at first, but I'm over it, I'm okay. Look, here's a, a, a public service message, please. <laughs> please always proofread your questions before you hit send, or you might get a response that you really don't want to hear. I, I know you don't want to know what's in my panties. You want to know what's in my pantry, right? Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about today. And look, I've thought a lot about this topic, and I've had a lot of trouble really getting it straight in my mind sometimes. I, I don't want to sit here and give you a whole list of food items to have in your kitchen. That, that's really kind of boring, right? I mean, because ultimately, you have to decide what to keep in your panties, your, in, in your pantry. Now, you got me doing it. And so, again, please read those messages before you hit send to me. Otherwise, I get weird ones like that. Look, I don't know what flavor combinations you like. I, I don't know your, your ethnic or regional or family influences. I don't know what you like to eat. So I can't tell you what to have in your pantry. These are the things that are entirely up to you. And Look, I don't keep sardines in my pantry. I don't eat sardines, right? But you might love them. It might be a standard in your pantry. I, on the other hand, have four different kinds of mustard in my refrigerator right now. That might be three or four too many kinds of mustard for you. I can give you some of these generalities, the things that most people keep on hand, but ultimately it's up to you to make the changes that you want. And reading a list of ingredients, it might be educational, but it's going to be really boring, and I don't like to be really boring. I, I work too hard trying to break this carefree cook code and, and share it with you to be boring. And since I'm always trying to bring you the secrets taught in culinary school, the techniques that professionals use that you can steal and put into your own home, I'm going to approach this food vault class in the same way as if I were ordering food at a large hospital, which I've done. I used to buy $1.5 million worth of food per week when I was executive chef at a large hospital. $1.5 million of grocery shopping <laughs> per week. That's a lot of food, right? That's a lot of money and that's a lot of food to keep track of. Well, you can imagine we had a really large pantry. We even had a pantry steward. It's the guy whose job it is to fulfill all the requisitions for the food and keep the inventory. But <laughs> I remember at the hospital, this guy was such a pain in the butt. I was the guy with the money. Okay, I was the guy that bought all the food, but he was the guy that controlled it. And I used to laugh. I used to say, he's like the troll under the bridge. You know, We used to say, hey, do you need something? Go ask the troll under the bridge. Because so, you'd go there, you'd be like, hey, Joe, uh, can I get a, a case of uh, canned tomatoes? And be like, I, you must answer a riddle first. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? What has wings but does not fly? What lays but never down? And what is afraid of everything? Riddle me this! 
You might be like, oh, God, you ask me this every time I come for tomatoes. It's a chicken, okay? It's always a chicken. The answer is the same. Give me my darn tomatoes because I got to go cook. I, you know I'm being silly. That's really not how it went, and that's not even the guy. <laughs> I, I found that guy on Google. But it, it's the first point I want to make because in your home, you are the pantry steward and the chef, right? You requisition things from your cabinet and you go ahead and you use them in your cooking. What if there were two people doing this? There's not in your house. There's only one. You have no troll under the bridge. But let me ask you this. Do you keep track of your stuff like a pantry steward would? Do you know how much of something you use over a period of time? Think about that for a minute. How much of whatever you have in your pantry right now, how often do you replenish it? That's the pantry steward's job. Do you know how often you purchase things? That could tell you how often you go to the grocery store and ultimately could save you money. But what this all comes down to, and this is what's really going to be shocking to you, do you know the value of all the items in your cabinet, in your pantry? You might be shocked how much money is sitting around. These are the questions that I have to answer every week as an executive chef at a large hospital. If I kept too much food on hand, my food cost would rise. If I kept too little food on hand, I might run out. And that's terrible because <laughs> if you run out of stuff as the executive chef of a hospital, people potentially could get sicker. Or at least I don't have options if I run out of things. Like There were two things that I made sure I never ran out of as executive chef at a large hospital. One of them was very, very simple. One of them was very complicated. The first was lasagna noodles. We made a lot of lasagna <laughs> at, the, uh, at the hospital, and I was always running out of lasagna noodles for some reason. And we bought them in 50-pound cases because we're making a hundred loaves of lasagna at a time. And when you run out of the lasagna noodles that are delivered by the truck, then you got to go to the local grocery store. You wipe out their shelves. I used to walk in there with two shopping carts and buy every lasagna noodle they have. And that's annoying. I don't want to go to the grocery store. So that was the simple one. But the complicated one was we had formulas for people that were very sick, canned nutritional supplements. And if I ran out of them, that really could be life or death. And that's why it was so important. And this is the balance between having a usable inventory and an unused inventory. It's the difference between profit and loss in a restaurant. And as executive chef at a hospital, it's the difference between life and death. That's why I want to share the professional pantry secrets today. Not, not just shopping lists, things like that. Some of them might seem a bit much for you <laughs> in your home. It might be a little intense, but you might also choose to take these ideas and really take control of your food and money by employing some of these ideas that I'm going to share with you today. So let's get started here. The benefits of good pantry management. Number one, you have the items on hand, okay? You, you can't cook by method over recipes if you don't have anything to cook with. And you definitely can't cook with recipes if you don't run out every time it tells you to go get something. These are the flavors that you like. The ones that you find yourself applying to your creations, no matter how you're cooking them, no matter what method, but you always find yourself using oregano or black beans or whatever it might be. The second is reducing trips to the market. You, you actually lower your food bill when you make less trips to the market, you know you pick up stuff that you don't need. Less trips to the market, less money. Or if the market's far from you, you, you save a lot of time. You save gas by not having to drive back and forth or for things that you want or things that you forgot. You develop your pantry. You know, another benefit of this is you narrow your scope. It, when you start to be aware of your pantry, you narrow the scope of the items that you store. And thoughtful pantry building means you don't have unused items that take up space. You only use what you'll, uh, you'll only keep what you'll use in the immediate future. And the other great benefit is you know the value of all the food items on hand. And I know, because I've taught this so many times, I know the wheels are working in your head right now. You're looking around going, oh my goodness, how much money do I have locked up in this kitchen? You, you, you can't manage a food budget if you have hundreds of dollars sitting in your cabinets that you're not making meals from. 
And the last benefit is that, that you're be able to create a, a shopping list cycle. When you start thinking about this, you, you start to know how often you use each item and you purchase it in that frequency. You don't just buy it to have it on the shelf. You know when you use things up. And some of the easiest items you know, you buy a half gallon of milk a week or you buy uh, three containers of yogurt. Some of this stuff you know about, and in, in just naturally, some of the stuff you're really going to have to observe how you've been using this food. And these five benefits of managing your food vault can make your cooking so much easier, so much quicker. It can give you a greater variety of things that you can just whip up, and ultimately it saves you money. Managing your pantry, why do you think they do it on a million and a half dollars a month? They hire a guy to manage the pantry. I'm glad they didn't stick me with the responsibility, but it's so important from a money standpoint that you need to bring this into your house as well. So, okay, how do we do this, Chef Todd? I know all that stuff sounds great, but uh, let me help you with how to go ahead and choose your pantry items. And in a commercial kitchen, the pantry is built from the recipes, okay? Standardized recipes at a hospital because for the most part, health is at stake. In the cafeteria, we didn't care about those people. They, <laughs> I'm only kidding, but they, there was no health restrictions in the cafeteria. Up to the rooms, up to the different wards, absolutely. So we had standard recipes and that's where the pantry is built from. The recipes are derived from the menu, from menu to recipe, from recipe to pantry item that you need to create those recipes. And since I know my hospital menu weeks in advance, it's a cycle menu, I, j I just go down each standardized recipes ingredients and I make a shopping list that then becomes the pantry list. And that's what we keep on hand. And in your home, you know, you're probably not writing a cycle menu for the next five weeks like we do as an industrial chef of that regard. Um, but you, you, you may, um, I've got hair in my eyes. <laughs> you're not going to write a five-week cycle menu is the point I'm going to make. You, you're not going to have standardized recipes because I want you to cook carefree. You don't have 60 cooks and chefs trying to duplicate the recipe that you wrote on based on specifications and, and demands of a nutritionist. You know, it, it's really just you. You're a carefree cook. You cook by method. You don't have a dietitian looking over your shoulder. You figure out what you've got on hand and you cook it in a dependable, reliable, repeatable method. And this actually makes creating your pantry harder than you would think. Because how can you know what ingredients that you're going to need in three days? or in seven days, or two weeks from tomorrow. How do you know this? I know you're probably commenting, Chef Todd, how do I know what I'm going to cook next week? Well, you don't. You never do. If you're a carefree cook, you never do, but you guess, right? What, how does a painter know what, what scene they're going to paint in, until they make sure they have blue and red and green and yellow to start painting it? We all have a basic repertoire of the foods that we cook again and again. You know, we all do it. No matter the size of the variety of the foods that you cook, you know you always come back to your favorites. So you do have a food cycle. It might not be a written cycle menu, but you know you have a cycle of things. Spaghetti comes up every four or five days, right? But when you're aware of your food cycle, then you can start ordering like an executive chef. You, you keep an eye on the budget without running out of anything. And that's the key. So if you're not looking for a cycle of the same exact dishes, this is not, not not what I'm talking about, but it's the fact that you'll always be making rice a bunch of different times. You might always be making pasta. So you keep rice and pasta in your pantry and you watch how quickly you use it. You might use beans more than someone else. You might be doing more stir fries than your neighbor. These are going to call for different pantry items. So there are certain items that you're going to use multiple times in your cooking cycle between market trips. And this is how you build your own personal inventory for the pantry items that you need. So stick with me with this because uh, I'm going to give you some keys to this in a minute. At the hospital um, and at the National Security Agency where I was cooking for thousands of people, I had a clipboard of about 50 pages of items. And every Friday, I'd go ahead and take inventory. I'd count each and every item, and from that would come the food order for the next week. But no matter how big or small the food operation, all of these inventories, whether it's my hospital or cooking for 30,000 people or your home, 
all these things should be broken into categories. And you know that's one of my favorite things. You might want to write these things down or you might want to come back to this video later, watch the replay when we're done because this is really going to help you. So our categories are, first of all, dry goods. And these are the shelf-stable dried items like rice, dried beans, grains, cereals, uh, uh, dried fruit, nuts, pasta, lentils, things like that, all your herbs, dried herbs and spices. But this also includes anything from the bake shop. Flour, sugar, baking soda, cornstarch, uh, cocoa, dry yeast, powdered milk. These things are great in your pantry because they don't go bad. They, they basically keep their uh, um, quality unless they get wet. The next thing is canned goods, and this is self-explanatory. These are things in a jar, canned vegetables, canned fruits, soups, uh, canned meats, tuna, things like that, canned or carton broths or juices. Again, long shelf life on this thing. Uh, then third, you've got fats, oils, and flavorings, and these are all your oils, uh, things like honey, vinegars, syrups, condiments, jellies, sauces, take an inventory of those things. Now these go bad a little more quickly than dry goods and canned goods, so it's a good idea to keep less of them on hand. Then you've got your refrigerated items, your fresh produce, fruits and vegetables, eggs, uh, dairy products, fresh meats and butter, things like that. These are the most perishable, so if your electricity does go out, you know, an impending huge storm comes, these are the things that are definitely going to spoil more quickly. Refrigerated items should be the lowest inventory because they should be turned over more quickly. And I'm going to explain turning over your inventory in just a minute. Don't go away. You're going to want to see that. The fifth thing is frozen items, meats and proteins, breads, bread dough, frozen vegetables, frozen fruit, things like that. They also have a long shelf life, but they do deteriorate in the freezer. And again, if you lose electricity, all that stuff is shot. So from these five categories, you start to build your pantry list, and here's how you do it. Go through your kitchen right now. Not, not right now, when we're done. Go through your kitchen, write down every single thing you see in your cabinets. Write down everything you see in your refrigerator or your freezer and assign it to one of the categories that I've just mentioned. And now you've got the start of your pantry list, categorized. Then review the list and eliminate anything that's been there for a long time. Anything you're just keeping in storage, don't put it on your list. You're not going to buy it again, all right? Just eliminate that. You don't have to throw it out yet, but don't put it on your list. Put the stuff on your list that you find that you use again and again. Then add items to the list that you'd like to include in your pantry in the future. This is, this is your carefree cooking journey. What do you want to make in the future? And there you go. You've got your pantry list. The stuff you use all the time, the stuff you use most frequently, categorize with the stuff you're going to use in the future. It's the items you're currently cooking with, and it's the ones that you're going to be using in the future. And you can review this list every month if you want, every few months, every year, and eliminate the unused items and add back the new ones. It's a, it's a continual process. It's something I did weekly for a million dollars worth of food. So you know it's important. And certainly you can do it once or twice a year you want. Keep your pantry lean and mean so that you're cooking well and whipping stuff up. Everyone goes through food trends, okay, in their cooking. So things will change. If you just figured out how to make the best beef stroganoff ever and you find yourself making it two or three times a month, well, in your pantry you should have some beef, some dry egg noodles, some sour cream when you start making that again. But then you get sick of beef stroganoff, right? You want to discover something new and you start cooking in a Thai style. So scratch off the sour cream, replace it with a can of coconut milk. Add uh, sriracha sauce to your pantry. Add peanut butter to your pantry uh, until you get sick of that and you discover something else. And then there's no need to keep the egg noodles around because you're not making beef stroganoff anymore. And you see how it kind of works as a cycle because here's the big idea. Okay, here's the payoff. I don't have a lot of time left. Here's the big idea that I teach in culinary school. And in culinary school, this class is called Purchasing, Food Costing, and Inventory Management. It's boring. Food vault sounds better. <laughs> Purchasing, food costing, and inventory management. I've taught the class maybe about 20 times, and it's a 50-hour class. 50 hours talking about the pantry. Because the main idea in managing a restaurant or a food establishment is this one thought that I drill into my students' heads. And it's this. 
Write this down. Screenshot it as well because the whole idea with the commercial food operation is in the back door, through the kitchen, and out the front door as quickly as possible. This is the mantra of running a pantry professionally or at home. Your food should come in the back door, having been received from the grocery store through the kitchen and then out the front door. And really what this means is that anything I purchase as the executive chef, it better get cooked and turned into money as fast as possible, or I don't have money to go buy new food. You get the idea? In the back door, into the chef's hands, through the cash register is probably a better way to say it because if I buy food and I put it on the shelf and I don't cook with it, it costs me money. And then the next week I buy food, I put it on the shelf without turning it into a meal, without turning it into money, not selling it. And I do this week after week. And then what I got is a huge pantry with no sales to show for the food that I've been buying. And I'm probably out of a job as an executive chef because I'd be a horrible executive chef if I did that. Uh, another quick story, I did some restaurant consulting uh, many years ago, and they were telling me how they're not making money, and they don't understand. The restaurant is busy. The restaurant is full. We're not making any money. I opened their freezer. There must have been $100,000 worth of food in their freezer. Steaks and seafood and stuff that it's obvious that the chef is just ordering too much food. Are you doing this? I'm going to ask you again. Are you doing this. Be honest with yourself. Do you have a huge pantry and few meals to show for it? Because good pantry management doesn't mean being a hoarder, storing everything possible in case you might need it. Those are the things that you never need. You ever notice that? And those things that the recipe commanded you to buy two years ago, you haven't used it since? A good pantry has the items that you consistently use, that you will use in the future, or that you want to use for soon. It's not supposed to be a museum of food that was on sale at some point. And there's a number of executive chefs uh, uh, that executive chefs go by. It's a very important number that executive chefs go by. It's called inventory turns. And Briefly, because we don't have 50 hours <laughs> for this class today, turns is a number that's derived by dividing the value of your inventory, the cash value of your inventory, and the sales dollars for the same period. And the idea is that you want to turn over your inventory as quickly as possible. Remember, in the back door, through the kitchen, out the front door as quickly as possible. So a turn number that is higher means you're turning the food into money quickly. A lower inventory turn means that you're storing too much food and you're not selling it or serving it. So this is a concept that, that can be applied to your home kitchen as well. It's, a, it's an advanced concept. It's one of the things I wanted to share with you, but it, it really, it becomes a very advanced way that you, I don't know, may you may or may not want to put it into use in your kitchen, but it could have great benefits. Or you might just want to keep these ideas in your head and be aware of these concepts as you get ready to shop. And my suggestion is you go ahead and make yourself a spreadsheet. I mean, if you're watching me today, you're computer savvy, right? So create a sheet of all the pantry items that you have and go back, look at the receipts and put the costs in there and add the pantry items to the sheets and then transfer the costs of all the items and do that math. When you multiply the number of items you have by the cost, you get the total value of the items in your pantry. You might be shocked. It's unbelievable. Can you, could you use this money for something else? Maybe this, all this money that's sitting in your cabinets, could, could you go on a vacation with it? All right. Maybe it's not that much, but perhaps you realize that you can use more fresh ingredients because those turn over more quickly. So when you figure the turn on each item, not like a hospital did because we track that that way, but if you put a value, a day value on each item and see how quickly you use them up, you will save your grocery shopping time as well. So you put on that spreadsheet, fill in the day that you bought it, 
and then the day that you bought it again and give yourself a turn number on each of those things. It's amazing. In, in, in a beneficial cycle, you'll see how much you use and then that'll help you decide how much to buy. And this will save you money over not over purchasing. You come home with a can of lima beans and you already got a can of lima beans. Good pantry management means <laughs> not being a hoarder. Your food vault should contain the dry goods, the canned goods, the fats, oils, and flavorings, the refrigerated and frozen items that you're going to use in your cooking between now and the next time that you go shopping. Remember, in the back door, through the kitchen, and out the front door as quickly as possible. Or from a home cook sense, from the market onto the plate and into someone's stomach. <laughs> as fast as possible. So uh, let, me, let me ask you a, uh, a a question. Where are we? There we are. Let me ask you a question, something in the kindest way here. If I were to come to your house, would you be embarrassed about your pantry? Uh, are there things that you're keeping in there that really should be donated to the local food bank? Instead of frozen money, which is what you got, how about putting that money to work? for somebody else. That's the last thing. Okay, uh, I go scrolling through our Carefree Cooks community. I'm looking for a good use of pantry items this week, and I have found the following scroll stoppers. Uh, Darren, this was so cool, Darren dubbed this his clean out the fridge quiche. Bacon, green onion, asparagus, and three or four kinds of cheese left over from an earlier cocktail party right out of the pantry. Nicely done, Darren. Uh, Mary is making roux ahead of time to store in her pantry. Uh, she's made white, blonde, and dark roux that she's going to thicken uh, for, use to thicken for a future sauce or soup or something. Really good thing to keep in your pantry. Pre-made roux. Uh, last month, Brian added a tomato enchilada sauce to his salsa verde enchiladas. This week, he decided to replace half the tomatoes with pineapple. Okay, a pineapple tomato salsa. Uh, his quote was, holy moly, I'm loving the freedom of carefree cooking. Thanks. <laughs> April uh, did a baked coconut chicken breast topped with tomato and bacon relish, Italian green beans, onions and sun-dried tomatoes, all the things that you could have in your pantry right now. And Julie had a really large party, a uh, really large pantry in her backyard along with a party. Uh, her backyard is the ocean. So when your pantry is the ocean, you can whip up some really fresh blackened ahi over a garden salad. Those are our uh, dishes of the week from our Carefree Cooks community. Uh, our What Am I for this week? There it was. It is carrot, onion, celery, uh, eight letters with a French flag. That's called mirepoix. Mirepoix, carrot, onion, celery is the way we start most dishes. And if you know someone with way too much frozen money in their pantry, please share this video with them. Give it a thumbs up. Give me some likes, some hearts. Uh, let Facebook know that you think it was worthwhile, that you like it too. And, you know, when you choose the freshest ingredients, you get extra days in storage and you save money also. And the freshest ingredients also make the most vibrant and delicious meals. And this week's free online class is Buy Fresh, Cook Simple, Eat Well. It's my simple five-step plan toward healthy cooking. And I'll go ahead and put a link in the description of this video. If you want to hold your spot in the class session now, go ahead, go to webcookingclasses.com slash fresh and find a time that's right for you. Webcookingclasses.com slash fresh. Hey, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you uh, that there's a method to your pantry cooking success. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye, everyone.